Amen. I invite you to turn with me this morning to Revelation chapter 2. So we look at the letter to the church in Pergamum. We're going to see that where we live should shape our expectations. Uh, one day I received a phone call from Sherilyn's before we came here uh, to Hamilton. We were living in an apartment in South Garland. And Sherilyn, she called saying that she was hearing loud popping noises outside and she wasn't sure what it was, but it sounded very much like gunfire. And so because of where we lived, I was concerned that it was legitimately gunfire and I told her, okay, you need to get the gun, go lock yourself in the bathroom, wait for the bad guy to come and then blow him away when he comes in. We found out later that it was actually just a transformer that was, uh, the transformers were popping. I don't know what was going on. Jimmy could probably <laughs> explain to us what was happening. But because of where we lived, she assumed because of the noise that, that, that it was actual gunfire. We weren't in the worst part of town, but we certainly weren't in the best. Uh, Break-ins and drug busts and even occasional gun violence was not out of the ordinary. So where we live kind of shaped our expectations of the things that we were hearing and experiencing there. Now when I hear gunfire living in Hamilton, I just figure it must be dove season or something. <laughs> Many believers are taken by surprise when they experience hostility in this world. Many believers are seduced away from Christ when they experience the temptations of this world. And that being taken by surprise comes from failing to remember where we live as Christians. We don't live in a nice world that loves our Jesus. We live in hostile enemy territory. And we need to remember that so that we're not taken by surprise. As we look at this letter this morning, we're going to be called to remember where we live and to remember why we live as believers lest we be led into compromise and sin. I invite you to pray with me. Let's ask for God's grace in this time. Lord Jesus, we praise you that at the cross, through your death and the bloodshed, we have found forgiveness of sin. And I confess how easy it is to forget of how great a grace that is. But Lord, we are sinners, deserving of death. And yet you have loved us so tremendously, completely, and fully. You are worthy of praise. You are worthy of love and devotion. Thank you, Lord, for saving Sinners like us. We are in continued need of your grace this morning. For your word to break through the hardness of heart, the distractions of our minds, and the pains of our lives. We need your word to break through, to convict, to encourage, and to transform. So we pray for your grace, my Lord, in this time. In weakness, we come to you asking that you would prove yourself strong. In our folly, we come to you asking that your wisdom would change us. Lord, we pray that you would grant us faith and belief in response to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Revelation chapter 2, we'll be starting in verse 12 as we continue through the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia. We are moving now to the church in Pergamum. Pergamum was a pretty important city in Asia. It was the capital city of Asia and uh, it had a very um, important uh, physical location. It sat on top of the, a thousand foot hill that kind of overlooked the Caicos Valley. It was extremely prominent and easily fortified from a military standpoint. And at the top of this uh, hill of this town was this crowning temple to Zeus, the patron god of the Greeks. 
Uh, Pergamum was an extremely religious city. Uh, It was the head of the imperial cult. It was the first city in Asia to be granted the right to build a temple to a living Caesar, Caesar Augustus. Usually you had to wait till they died to build temples to them, but Pergamum was granted that ability. So emperor worship was extremely popular in this town. Uh, The town itself was called a temple ward and a guardian of both Rome worship and pagan worship. And because of all this, it made it very difficult for Christians to live in this town without being confronted with the demand to compromise on the gospel. So Jesus writes this letter to these believers who live in Pergamum. He says in verse 12, starting verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas my witness my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells As we've seen and we'll continue to see, Jesus begins each letter by referencing back to something that John saw in chapter 1 or something that John heard from Jesus in chapter 1. And here we we see back in chapter 1 verse 16, Jesus having out of his mouth this sharp two-edged sword coming. And Jesus uses this image for for himself, this title for himself, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword to address this congregation. We're going to see two reasons why he chose that image for this particular church. And the first reason, the, the, the positive reason, if you will, is because of Pergamum's relationship to Rome. As I said, it's the capital city, not just of Asia Minor politically, but also of the imperial cult. It was the central location for worshiping Caesar and worshiping the goddess of Rome. This particular time period was known as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And and if you go back and you look at history, they they boasted and they bragged that Rome brought peace to the world. Uh, but if you go back in time and you're a citizen in Rome, you know that it wasn't actually very peaceful. Rome held that peace through violence, through the sword. Rome was not too ashamed to brag and boast about their ability to wield the sword. So it's very significant for believers who live in Pergamum where Satan dwells to remember that Rome may have a sword, but Jesus has the sword that really matters. It's a sharp sword, meaning it cuts quickly. It's a double-edged sword, meaning there's no blunt part to the sword that Jesus wields. And so for a positive image for this, we see an encouragement to believers that Rome may use a sword against them, but Jesus has a more important sword that he will use against the one who persecutes them. So he begins his letter saying, I know, in this particular no section, he has three things that he knows. And the first is about where they dwell. I know where you dwell. In fact, verse 13 begins and ends with this concept of where you dwell. This isn't the word that, that the, we see often translated as sojourn, that means kind of you're there visiting. This is the word that means this is your home. This is where you have settled down. He says, I know where you dwell, believers. And I know that where you dwell is also where Satan dwells. It's not just where Satan dwells, it's where he has his throne. And so Jesus is saying to them, I know basically that you are living in the heart of enemy territory. Now people debate about what it means by Satan's throne. A throne represents authority, it represents power. And I don't think Jesus is saying that Pergamum is unique and that the throne of Satan is only in that one town because there are other towns throughout the ancient world that were just as evil, if not more so. But I think what he's saying by saying, I know that Satan's throne is where you live, is that he's saying, I understand that Satan is in control of where you live. He's the boss. He's the king. He's the ruler of where you live. And the reality is, the scripture reveals, Satan is the Lord of this earth, the ruler of this age. 
He is the prince of darkness and the kingdom of darkness is his. And Jesus is starting this whole letter by saying, I understand that you live in a hostile world where darkness reigns. And that's really, really important and really significant for believers to take note of because it's not just those in Pergamum, but it's even us today that we live in a hostile world. It's not just a broken world. It's a dark world. And he says, I know where you live. And it's not just about where they live. It's also about what happens because of where they live. The, the other two things Jesus knows about this congregation is that they hold fast the name of Jesus and they refused to deny the faith of Jesus or faith in Jesus even when it got costly. Now, we don't know anything about Antipas. We, outside of what's here, there are some later church traditions about him. All we really know about Antipas is what Jesus tells us here. And at some point before John received this revelation, the church in Pergamum had experienced an intense time of persecution. And this intense time of persecution involved the death of Antipas. Antipas, who refused to let go of the name of Jesus, even though it was going to cost him his very life. And Jesus points back to that moment. He says, I know that you refused to let go of my name. I know you refused to deny having faith in me. And I know that it cost Antipas his life. Now, from a worldly perspective, the church probably didn't look very good. Because in the world's eyes, the church was an entity that refused to worship Caesar and refused to worship the gods that they believed kept all of society going. In fact, in the ancient world, in, in the first century, the church was often charged with being atheist. And I know in our day, that would be crazy to call a Christian an atheist, but that's what they thought about Christians because Christians refused to believe that there were all these other gods. They would say, you see that big temple of Zeus is standing at the top? He's a lie. He's not real. And so they, they charged and slandered Christians as being atheists who refused to worship the gods that kept everything going. And so Antipas, he was charged with these things most likely and he was put to death. But, but notice what Jesus calls him because this is a really important thing to remember. He says, Antipas was my witness, my faithful one. This phrase uh, except with the addition of the word my, was used actually of Jesus back in chapter 1, verse 5. It calls Jesus Christ the faithful witness. So Antipas, even though he was overcome by the world, he was put to death by the world as a traitor to the world. From Jesus' perspective, Antipas became like Jesus. This is highly significant, Christian, as we are called to suffer for our faith, as we are called to sacrifice for our faith, that when we do that, we begin to be like Jesus. Don't view it as something, a hardship of why God, why. It's an opportunity when we are called to sacrifice for the faith, an opportunity to become like Jesus. So he says, I know that you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Holding fast and refusing to deny are basically two sides of the same coin. But it's really significant, the holding fast to the name of Jesus. From what we know from historical writings, the persecution that took place in the early church, whether it's first, second, or third century, it, it usually wasn't so much about emperor worship. It typically began with the fact that these Christians were refusing to worship the local deities. And so when they were refusing to worship the local deity, Rome would step in and say, well, look, you're kind of upsetting the apple cart here. We don't really care who you worship. You have to at least worship Caesar. If you will offer incense to Caesar and say that Caesar is Lord, uh, let go of this Jesus guy. Look, you can do whatever you want with him privately, but publicly you're going to proclaim Caesar is Lord, not Jesus is Lord. If you'll do that, we'll leave you alone, and you can do whatever you want. I, I don't really care past that. And so Christians would refuse to worship the local deities and therefore Rome would step in and say, well, you have to at least worship Caesar. And then Christians were challenged with this option, who's going to be Lord through the proclamation of their mouth? Are they going to proclaim Caesar Lord or are they going to hold fast to the name of Jesus? 
The name of Caesar would set them free for a moment. The name of Jesus, they believe, set them free for all of eternity. So which one are we going to hold on to? The temptation was to let go of Jesus, to hold on to Caesar so you could escape a, a, a moment of suffering and persecution. Jesus says, I know that, that you live in this hostile world where they hate you and they despise you, and I know that I'm the rival king in this world and that my name causes you suffering. But you held on to my name. And that's good. If we remember that Satan is the ruler of this world and that we live in a hostile and dark world and that our King Jesus is the rival to the throne, it should not surprise us that the darkness rages against the truth of Christianity. Because any time you live in a different country and you say that your king is better than their king, the people aren't going to like you very much. And the king's certainly not going to like it. But we cannot separate our faith from the name of Jesus. You cannot separate Jesus from the gospel. There is a choice that we have to make publicly. And as we see, these believers were being tempted to deny that faith publicly while holding on to it secretly. But before we get to that, I, I, I think that we need to remember what James says over in James 4. He says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We live in enemy territory. And when we begin to live as Christians should, the enemy doesn't like it. But remembering where we live gives us a chance to prepare for the enemy to rage against us. We should love our enemy, and we should pray for those who persecute us, but we must not betray our Lord to try to play nice with the kingdom of Satan. As we continue in the text, we're going to see that this requires us remembering why we are living this life in Christ. Verse 14, he says, but I have a few things against you, like we've talked about all of these letters except for two. They have something against, Jesus has something against the, the congregation. And this congregation, he says, I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now we saw the Nicolaitans back in uh, earlier in chapter 2 with the church in Ephesus. And it's interesting that Ephesus and Pergamum are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. Ephesus refused to tolerate any heresy, any false teaching while letting go of their first love. The church in Pergamum refused to let go of the name of Jesus while tolerating this heresy of the Nicolaitans. Jesus' response to both churches is going to be, repent. But he says, I have a few things against you, and that few things probably is, is, is pointing out to the fact that it's just a few people in your congregation who are holding to this teaching. We don't know much about the Nicolaitans really outside of Revelation. We just don't know anything about them. They did not last very long. But what we learn here in this text, Jesus he compares it to, to an Old Testament story in the book of Numbers as Israel is uh, moving towards the promised land and they're getting close to where they can finally enter the promised land after their 40 years of wandering. They come up to the territory of Moab and the king of Moab, Balak, he gets a little scared because Israel is a really, really large group of people and, he, and he's already seen them take out other nations. And so he sends to this prophet named Balaam Balaam has a reputation that those whom he curses are cursed, those whom he blesses are blessed. So he says, Balaam, I want you to come down. I want you to curse this people for me so that they will be cursed and they won't be able to, to come against me. So Balaam goes down. If you've read the story in Numbers, it's the, the famous story with the talking donkey. And uh, Balaam, he goes down and God tells him, you're going to say the only things that I tell you to say. And, and God forces the wicked prophet 
to declare blessing for Israel instead of a curse. Uh, it's really awesome how God just steps in and says, no, you're not going to curse my people. And so he forces the wicked prophet to do that. But then right after this situation, we read about how the sons of Israel were invited by the daughters of Moab to come and enjoy the feast to their gods. And this plague begins to break out as Israel falls into sin and into rebellion because in ancient world, feasting to their idols usually involved a little bit more than feasting as they would invite them not just to eat, but to engage in immorality. And so Israel was brought into this uh, uh, compromise with the Moabite women. And because of that compromise, this plague broke out on Israel. People died, and it was, it was a horrible situation. But in Numbers 31, we find out that this whole thing came about because Balaam counseled Balak to do that. In other words, Balaam's like, God won't let me curse the people directly. But if you really want to see the people fall, seduce them away from Yahweh. Just trick them into some compromise and the people will fall. I can't curse them, but they can condemn themselves if you just kind of lure them into it. So Balaam gives Balak that counsel, and Jesus says that he cast stumbling, a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. That word stumbling block in the Greek, it refers primarily to the piece of wood that you would put in a trap to hold the trap open to allow the animal to come in. And so it kind of gained this idea of a deceptive lure uh, to, to, to lure them into the trap and then spring it on them and close it on them. And so he says that that situation is, is what these Nicolaitans were doing. We don't really know what they taught theologically, but practically these Nicolaitans seem to be teaching that the church should engage in idolatry and sexual immorality. It could have been because of fear. Look, it's not that big of a deal, guys, is maybe what they were saying. If you just offer incense to Caesar, we know he's not really a god. And if you commit these acts of immorality with their temple prostitutes, I mean, ah, it's just the body. Jesus has forgiven it. It's okay. Just you'll take pressure off the church if you, if you just kind of give in and compromise in these little areas here. It could have been from that. We, we know that people had those thoughts and still do today. It could have been maybe not so much from fear, but because uh, sin is, is deceitfully delightful. It may have been we want to engage in these things. And we've done these things our whole life. Is there anything really that bad? We know they're not really gods anymore, but we're missing out on the party. We're missing out on the fun. And so maybe their whole idea was let's engage in these things because we want to engage in them. But whether it was fear of persecution or fear of missing out, these people were trying to compromise Christianity by saying, you, you can have Jesus and all this other stuff too. And Jesus condemns them for it and says that this compromise is not going to be allowed. Therefore, verse 16, repent. Some of you hold to this teaching, but you need to repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. So here we have that sword title coming back up and positively it could be a, a real big encouragement to Christians who are suffering to remember that our Jesus holds the sword of true judgment. That the throne of Satan is going to have the wrath of God poured out on it as we'll see later in chapter 16. It can be a real encouragement to remember who Jesus is. It can also be really terrifying when we're living in compromise to remember who Jesus is. See Jesus takes the compromise of his church quite seriously. And he says, look, I know that you are doing these things, that you're tolerating these things, that you're allowing these teachings to come in to where you're compromising the purity of my church, and I'm going to come to you, church, to wage war against them. Notice how he changes that. He says, I'm going to come to you, and I'll make war against them. So Jesus has kind of this distinction between the church as a whole and those within the church who are embracing this false teaching. But lest we, we, we get mistaken on this, it's not, don't worry all you guys who aren't involved in it, y'all won't be touched by this. Can the church truly experience the, experience the purifying power of Christ's sword in just a part of it and the whole not be affected by it? 
Can, can an individual within a church suffer and it not affect the whole? We just spent this whole weekend at family camp talking about the unity of the church and talking about the fact that we are one body and when one suffers, all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. And so Jesus is warning this church saying, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to deal with these people, but make no mistake about it, that dealing with these people will affect the church as a whole, even if it's just the grief of seeing those that they love be lost. So Jesus calls the whole church to repent. Look, we cannot, as a congregation, make other congregations behave rightly. We can't go across town or across the state or across the nation or across the world and tell a congregation, you got to stop doing this, you need to believe this, you need to believe... We can't do that. But we can, we should, in this congregation, root out compromise in our midst. As a congregation, we have a responsibility to make sure that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is being upheld by all of our members and that we are not tolerating within our midst heresy or a compromise to the faith. Because Jesus is going to come to his church and deal with it. And even if you aren't going to be judged because you aren't doing it, the sins of your brother, the sins of your sister do affect you. And so he's calling this church to stand against this compromise with the world lest he come to judge them. Now, that could be a hard message to listen to, but uh, let's end on a positive note, shall we? It's not simply let's root out compromise because Jesus is going to come judge us. But there's a very positive reason of why we should do this. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he's taking the lesson to Pergamon. He's now expanding it to all the churches, including you and me this morning. He says, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Now, out of all the promises and the letters, these are two of the most difficult for us to understand what on earth Jesus is talking about here in these promises. But let me just start by saying two things. First of all, all the promises to the overcomer in Revelation 2 and 3 are relating to the idea of eternal life. So salvation in eternity, eternal life. And he uses different word images to try to connect to, to the message of the letter to that church. The second thing that I'll note is that in this particular one, the promise is cast in the idea of hiddenness. Manna that is hidden, a name that you don't know. And I think that that's key to understand why this church is being promised that. So let's start with the first promise. I'll give some of the hidden manna. Uh, manna, if you remember your Old Testament history, was the, the, the odd substance that God provided to Israel in the wilderness uh, when they were complaining that they had no food and God provided supernaturally day after day after day after day for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness um, that he provided this, this um, bread-like substance in which they could sustain themselves out in the wilderness. And it continued all the way until Israel entered the promised land in Joshua 5. They ate some of the fruit of the promised land and the manna stopped. And there's a lot of different theories about this hidden manna. There's even Jewish tradition about hidden manna. But I just want to make this one point. This manna, this provision of God, is set in contrast to what these people were dealing with in eating in their feast to their pagan gods. And so you have set before you this table that... Of, of all this meat and this food that's been sacrificed or offered up to their idols. And they're being invited to come and participate at the table of all of these idols. And it's right there and it's tangible and it's touchable and it's tasteable. And, and they're being lured into it to compromise so that they might engage in that idolatry. And Jesus says, look, if you will forego that food that's set right before you, I have food you can't see that will take care of you. If you will let go of that food that you can grab right now, I have hidden manna that I will provide for you that will sustain you for all of eternity. 
Why live for that moment of joy and delight in something that kills you in the end when you have everlasting joy and everlasting life in Jesus forever and ever? He's saying, look, to him who overcomes, I got something that you can't see right now, but I will give it to you. Paul says that our life has been hidden with Christ. Christian, we may not see it, and oftentimes we don't feel it, and oftentimes we don't experience it to its fullness, this life that we have in Jesus Christ, because we live in a hostile world, we live in a broken world, and we still have a flesh that wages war against us, but our life in its fullness, it is a reality, it's just a reality that's hidden with Jesus Christ. And the day's going to come back, and going to come when he's going to come back, and in his presence, he's going to have our life, and he's going to give it to it, us. Or the day's going to come that you're going to breathe your last here, the brokenness is going to end, and you're going to enter into his presence and begin to experience real life. Don't let go of that hope by compromising to get something temporal here. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden. Manna, the second promise is that I'll give you a stone, a white stone with a new name written on that stone. Again, a lot of people have a lot of different views about what this white stone is. White in the book of Revelation typically stands for purity, righteousness, that kind of concept. The overcomers will be given a white robe showing that they have uh, come through and have been cleansed. But this white stone, uh, in the ancient world, they would often, you know, we have little tickets that we give out. They would often give out little stones that would be your entrance uh, into uh, gladiatorial games or events, things like that. So some people think maybe this is your, your, your ticket into heaven, your, your entrance stone into heaven, uh, whatever it might be. I think that it's significant that he says, I'm going to give you a stone that's got a name on it that no one na- knows except the one who receives it. We're going to see the same language that's used about Jesus in chapter 19. Jesus in chapter 19 has his name written on him and nobody knows it but him. And I don't think that we are talking about intellectual knowledge. I think we're talking more about experiential knowledge. And the reality is is that God in Christ Jesus has given us a new name. And only those who are in Christ Jesus truly know, experience that name in all of its fullness. If you're a Christian, that means you are in Christ Jesus and your identity has changed. I am no longer Andrew, the son of Dan. I am Andrew, the servant of Christ Jesus. I am a Christian. I have changed my identity fully and completely. And I'm learning what that means. Oh, but the day is coming when I will know as I have been known in fullness and completeness. So it's something you don't quite understand yet, but you will. Something you quite don't quite know yet, but you will. This is what's set before you, Christian. Overcomer. Hold firm to Jesus. Don't let go. Even though the world might push and it might tempt and it might pressure, don't let go of this hope. Remember why you live and sacrifice and suffer for Jesus because your hope is worth it. Remember why you live and you sacrifice for Jesus because your life is hidden with Him and it is coming. Remember why you live, Christian. Then you will be able to live in this hostile world without compromise. Peter says over in 1 Peter 4, For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality and lust and drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, abominable idolatries, In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. And they malign you. They slander you. But they'll give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The picture that Peter gives us is the same idea that Jesus calls the church in Pergamum to. You were sinners. Running off into all sorts of sinful debaucheries. You had enough time to do all of that. You're not that anymore. As a Christian, you're set free from sin. 
You've been set free from this cancer that kills everyone. And we should live in such a way that the world looks at us and they're like, why aren't you doing what we do? Why aren't you living like we live? We should live in such a way that the world maligns us because we don't align with them. Compromise is where we try to play nice and we try to align with them enough that we can have Jesus and be okay with them. I want to conclude with this. He says uh, in verse 13, you hold fast my name. In verse 14, there are some who hold fast the teaching of Balaam. Verse 15, there are some who hold fast the teaching of the Nicolaitans. There's a word played there with that idea of holding fast or holding on to. There are some who held on to the name of Jesus. But then there are some who are also holding on to these false teachings. And the, the idea that comes to my mind is you're trying to hold on to both. I want Jesus, but I also want all the pleasures of this world. I want Jesus, but I also want all the security of this life. I want Jesus, but I... What are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? Because I can tell you, Jesus doesn't want one hand. He wants both. He doesn't want half the heart. He wants the whole thing. He doesn't want a quarter of your life. He wants all of it. Jesus is an all or nothing kind of Lord. And you need to decide, what are you holding on to that's keeping you from holding on fully to Jesus? Let go of that so that you can hold on fully to Jesus. What compromise is destroying your witness or robbing you of the life that is yours in Jesus Christ? Let go of that so you can know life and life abundantly in Jesus us today church we must stop with the compromise with this world and the temptation can be when the world pushes and it pressures that there's that that fear and we say well if we just give them this much they'll be satisfied it will be okay i don't know if you've noticed in our world they're never satisfied i don't know if you've noticed with evil agendas it's never enough and we say, okay, we'll pass this law, you can have this. Or societally, we'll accept this practice. And then like, well, no, I actually want this practice to be accepted. No, I actually want this law to be passed. No, I actually want this. You see, you begin to compromise with the darkness, and the darkness doesn't say, okay, you can have your little pocket of light here. I've got enough. The darkness says, no, I want all of it. See, Jesus isn't the only one who wants everything. <laughs> Satan wants everything in your life, everything in your heart, and he's going to push and he's going to pressure and he's going to seduce and he's going to tempt till he can get everything from you. We must take a stand and let go of this world to hold only to Jesus Christ. We live for him, through him, and to him. This is why we live. All the other stuff that we get focused on is pointless in eternity. Remember why you live so that you can live without compromise in this dark and evil world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. That while you are willing to threaten your church with discipline, we can still see the love and the mercy and the grace in that call to repent. It is the hardness of our hearts that keeps us from it. So Lord, I pray that you would break the hardness of our hearts this morning. And I ask Holy Spirit that you would show us the compromises of our lives this morning. The ways that we play nice with the world, whether it's through fear or it's through desire. Lord, I pray that you would give us hearts that desire you and fear you and not this world. We look to you now for the grace to repent and to hold fast to your name in an evil and dark time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're not a Christian, or if you claim to be one while trying to play nice with this world, wake up. You're playing with death. 
and death will be what you reap. You cannot have life in sin. You cannot have Satan in Jesus. You cannot have light in darkness. These things stand opposite to each other. And if you cast your lot with Satan in darkness and sin, you will reap death because sin always brings death. Satan is destined for the lake of fire. Darkness will be put out by the light of Jesus Christ. That is just the truth, the reality of the day to come. And I am calling you, wake up and turn. Jesus does not bear the sword for nothing. He will judge. But my friend, I want you to also remember, he didn't bear the cross for nothing either. He bore the cross the weight of your sin that you might escape the sword and find life with Him. So if that's you this morning, let go of all of this darkness, unbelief, and hold on to Jesus and He will save your soul. Church, is there compromise in our midst? It begins first with you personally and individually. Because maybe the compromise is something nobody else has seen. A vice people don't know about. Behavior people don't know about. Beliefs that you keep secret or hidden. But all things are exposed to Jesus Christ. And if the Holy Spirit is exposing something to you in your heart and your mind of some way that you have compromised with the world, I call you to repent of it, believer. As your brother in Christ who falls under conviction as well. We need to repent that we might have Jesus. And then corporately, church, is there a way we compromise? A way that we play nice with the world and therefore lose our testimony for Jesus? He is worth holding on to with all that we have no matter the cost. So let us encourage one another day after day, as long as it's called today, to hold fast to Jesus, to not deny his name, knowing that what's hidden in him will be worth it in the end. Believers, stand with me. Friends, stand with me. And let's